Oh, good evening. Um, very warm welcome to the Orc Festival of Ideas and the uh, this species moment event. My name is Tom McLeish. I'm a physicist and professor in the Department of Physics, but professor of natural philosophy at the University of York, which gives me uh, the immense privilege of being able to join science to work, joining science up with uh, other disciplines, the arts, humanities and the social sciences and with people outside the university as well as within. Uh, this is the last of a series of four events embedded within the festival uh, entitled Science Imagination and the Big Questions. And we're very grateful to the John Templeton Foundation for, uh, for making it possible to put these events on. Before I get to tonight's uh, question and, and, uh, and conversation, uh, just a few technical notes as usual, uh, with apologies for those, uh, I hope nearly all of you have heard them at least 10 times over the last uh, two weeks. But um, if you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A uh, button just there, and please do start composing them as soon as they occur to you. You don't have to wait for uh, the uh, towards the second half of the event. If you have technical issues like a loss of Wi-Fi, you can just join again um, at the same uh, link that you used to join this first time. Also, don't forget tonight's event, like all uh, festival events, is being recorded and you'll be able to watch it and your friends and relations will be able to um, watch it on Catch Up under the festival YouTube chat channel. If you'd like to use subtitles or have them presented for you, um, then they're available again, bottom of the screen towards the right, you'll see a little button that uh, says CC Live Transcript, turn that on. It's usually good for a laugh in any case, um, although they don't do too badly these days uh, with uh, um, uh, English. Um, and uh, uh, so that, um, that does it for the technical introduction. Um, now onto the main event. So I uh, could not be happier and I could not have been more excited over the events of the festival so far um, than to be looking forward to tonight's uh, speaker. Krista Tippett is a Peabody Award winning broadcaster and a National Humanities Medalist uh, and the New York Times best uh, selling author. She's American as you'll have already picked up, and the founder uh, and presenter of the On Being project. We'll hear more about that uh, later, but if I tell you that the On Being podcast has by now had a third of a billion downloads, uh, you will understand why we're very privileged to have Krista here with us at the York Festival of Ideas. Um, she's also written a number of books, um, the latest of them, Becoming Wise, uh, an inquiry into uh, the mystery and art of living. And I hope we'll be able to talk a little bit about that uh, later on uh, this evening. Um, President Obama awarded Krista the National Humanities Medal at the White House. And I'll just read a uh, little bit of the citation for thoughtfully delving into the mysteries of human existence on the air and in print, Ms. Tippett avoids easy answers, embraces complexity, and invites people of every background to join her conversation about faith, ethics, and moral wisdom. In her latest book, Krista describes herself as, I quote, a person who listens for a living. So we at the York Festival Ideas are hoping tonight we might be able to persuade her in conversation to do a little bit of talking as well. Krista, please do come and join me. No time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I should also say that Krista is one of the people I count my highest privilege to have got to know just a little bit in my in my life. So uh, the only downer is that we aren't on a stage uh, and looking forward to a meal together later. But another another time, I hope. That is very sad. I've always wanted to spend more time in Yorkshire, and but I'll, if this is what it takes, I'll. God's own county. We have every, we have everything here um, from, the, from the coastline <laughs> to, the, to the dales. Well, you know that. Well, to, but it will it will happen. It will happen. Let's talk about the first. I just want we'll talk about home places in just a little while. But I wonder if for the benefit of of the UK audience. Um, here, who many of who do know about On Being, but it's not as many as in the States, whether you'd just like to say a little bit about what the On Being project is, what it was, what your vision for it was, and what it's become. Well, it's, it started as a, as a public radio show, and I would say the closest thing to that in the UK would be Radio 4, um, uh, before podcasting, which wasn't that long ago. No. And um, it has since become a public radio 
and podcast. And what I wanted to explore were, um, it, well, first of all, this entire aspect of human existence and the human enterprise, which is, which is religion, which is spiritual inquiry. That was the original impulse, moral imagination. I felt like we know how to speak um, about so many aspects of human existence in public, but not these. And that in fact, for so many of us, so much of the time, these are the subjects we're longing to delve into. Um, so that was the impetus. Um, as to, I, I, I like to say now that I started the show at the turn of the century. And of course, the 21st century, the young 21st century has been eventful. Mm. And I think our, our encounter, the, the 21st century encounter with religion and spirituality uh, like our encounter with most of our disciplines and subjects has been rapidly evolving. And mm -hmm. so it's been a great adventure. And, I, and I, we also, yeah, we have a social healing aspect to our work now as well, right. because we realized that that's how people were taking this content into their lives. And so we've been building that out. And I would say, especially in the last year, that's been very present. Right. And that's become a, a second project of um, consilience project uh, uh, that well there yeah we created something called the civil conversations project mm -hmm. a few years ago um but i started to realize that we that that's not quite big enough for for where the world is has been going and is and so we now have a, a team of um social healing practitioners and we're figuring this out how to do that together with a media project that, that sounds like being what all the world needs uh, right, right now. Uh, but let me ask you one other aspect of the development of on being. It started off being spiritual and moral life and those questions, yeah. but you end up talking with quite a few scientists and, and yeah. I, I love it when you do. I wonder if you'd anticipated that or whether that was something that came along from outside or whether it emerged from the sort of spiritual model, moral in a surprising way. It absolutely emerged from it, which you understand, yeah. but it wasn't obvious to a lot of people. In the beginning, when I started this, it was the early 21st century. In the United States, we had a, an evangelical Christian president. We, you know, it was the immediate post 9-11 years when, mm -hmm. when the religion of Islam, which was already a vast global uh, presence, you know, very tragically and catastrophically was introduced to many Americans anyway, by way of this, this event. And so, uh, what, one of the things that was important to me at that point was to, to bring into relief the what our religious traditions offer to, again, as to the entire human enterprise and, um, and, and, the, and, the, and the intellectual as well as the spiritual content of that. And both of those things get lost in the way religion enters the news. Um, but as we kind of created the show and moved forward and this century moved forward, what I realized, because so the show is called Speaking of Faith in the beginning, but what I realized is that what I was really interested in, what really tracing, or, or not the answers, but the animating questions mm. behind this part of life. Mm. The animating questions being, what does it mean to be human? How do we want to live? And who will we be to each other? Yeah. And what I also started to understand more deeply, and it's been thrilling, is that in, in our time, I think physicists and evolutionary biologists and neuroscientists are every bit uh, as much uh, adventurers and, and, dis and in discovery on that territory of un explaining us to ourselves and of, of us, of us cr having a more sophisticated understanding of the human condition that actually helps us live. And, and I think it's a little known fact about, about the great religious traditions that they also possess a very sophisticated analysis of the human condition in yes. some ways science is catching up with yeah. and even a cosmic perspective yeah. um so these things to me as historically is actually true are not by definition in conflict with each other no um and you know it, it's interesting that for me because as a scientist um and also uh, a member of a, of a faith tradition yeah. by choice um, those two don't conflict with me, and it's, I've had to work out why they conflict to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it is because, as you say, that there's a... Uh, well, history is important, we should come on to that, but, but one thing is about questions. It's sometimes the way science is framed is, 
it's framed as a neat little box of answers where actually it's about creative questions far more. Um, and there I think is perhaps where, where, where we join forces. And I think so. I also believe the, my experience is that scientists, um, many scientists have a much more robust vocabulary of mystery than many theologians. Couldn't couldn't survive without it. Couldn't survive without it. Um, I've I've had a lovely day today. I've been to you know I've I have a lovely project with a, a wonderful Dutch postdoctoral scientist Charlie Charlie Schaefer, and we're, we're we're studying the physics of silk, and actually I feel this as I'm treading on holy ground. Silk, 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 uh, silk worm, silk, silk materials, um, and how silk is formed. And uh, yet again, I'm it, it's somehow particularly lovely to do to be working out the molecular physics of how this stuff is formed, but that has been so culturally embedded for centuries. Um, but time, talking of centuries and the, the long story, before we get to, I will ask you in a minute, what you want to, what you mean by this species moment, um, <laughs> before we finish the evening, it will be a good idea. But as a moment is a moment in time, I, I, I've wanted, first of all, to to ask you about your encounter with time. The reason being, I was really struck reading in your, your latest book, in, in Becoming Wise, of, and you must have done this deliberately, a juxtaposition of the metaphor of layering. Uh, when you said it, your Oklahoma history, because of various things to do with your, your parents and, and immigration and adoption and so forth, um, you describe your Oklahoma Homer history of your childhood as quote just one layer deep is what you write and then just a couple of pages on I think it's the next page you talk about your experience as a reporter in Berlin and your encounter with German and Germany and you say you write German history is so many layers deep and then I hear and just did the other day you were talking with Rob McFarland who uh, writes his lovely books and you were getting all excited as he was about ice cores which are millions of layers deep. So I wonder if, you know, is, is your relationship with time one of deepening layers? And do you wish to share with us all that experience of finding out about ourselves and being by learning about more deep and deeper layers of time? Yes, so what an interesting question. And it's phrased, it's, you've, you've framed it so interestingly to me as somebody who's looking at my writing from the outside in. Um, this will not be, this may be hard for, uh, for UK or, or for European um, listeners to understand, but Prius. history is very thin, it, especially I grew up in the middle of the middle of America. I grew up in a place, Oklahoma, where people were in fact fleeing their histories. Um, and also where other people along what we call the Trail of Tears, tribal peoples were forcibly removed mm -hmm. from their histories. Mm -hmm. And this is not an analysis I would have been able to make growing up, but what I've understood as I got further away, and it's a very American phenomenon, you know, there's creativity that comes with releasing the shackles of what came before, but there's also depth that is lost, there's understanding mm -hmm. that is lost, and I think especially now, and in this year, very vividly, we are understanding in this country in particular, but but everywhere in the West, how, how much of how much of our own story we haven't told and how much of our story doesn't actually correspond to who we say we are and who we want to be. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, going to Germany, where where history is beyond complex and dramatic and looms large. And that was fascinating to me. But you know, I studied theology after I was in Germany, and um, and what I've you know, and 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 I'll also another thing that's really shaped my understand my thinking about time was um, one of the early shows we did uh, for my for on being or speaking of faith, which was about Einstein, and I interviewed Paul Davies, who you probably know. Yeah, yeah. Um, Einstein's and what Einstein revealed about time. And the fascinating reality that while we live in this world that is still structured with a, a Newtonian sense of time as something linear and literal and forward moving and, and rigid and about deadlines and schedules and this bully that I think time feels like in our bodies. Mm. Um, Einstein actually restored time, he, a sense of time that is actually akin to the sense of time in cultures 
and mm. religions. It's really more like a biblical sense of time. It's also the sense of time that we know. I mean, that past, present, and future in the way time actually works, our senses can't comprehend this, but mm -hmm. we know this in our lives that past, present, and future are always in interplay with each other. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a story you're not telling yourself, even mm -hmm. if it's a story you didn't learn. Mm -hmm. um, I've, and that, so, I, you know, and Tom, just this year, I thought so much about, I've really appreciated this, this uh, when I learned, when I did study theology, this, these these cosmic which i think there's also a cosmic sense of time which corresponds to a biblical sense of time and you know geological time um this this distinction in the in the biblical greek between kairos time and chronos time right. and okay. chronos is the newtonian time mm. and it's it's events in succession but kairos time is is an inbreaking it's it can be a moment it can be a moment like the one we're living in that i think mm. may be a century long mm. a moment with a capital m um which kind of breaks in and disrupts everything that came before mm. and it's also a moment of opportunity um you know to that is kind of how i so you know just just circling back one more time to berlin living in divided berlin in the years right before the wall fell experiencing the world utterly changing in ways that no one saw coming with mm. that drama with that completion with global effect i never expected to to inhabit a moment like that in my life mm. but 2020 was such a moment um mm where there was a distinct before with a capital B and an after with a capital A. Mm -hmm. It's a Kairos time. Yes. I wonder if um, uh, uh, people who are uh, particularly spiritually aware or contemplatively aware talk about thin places, yes. um, the Iona community, even, but there's yeah. been a long thin time. Thin yeah. times, exactly. Yeah. Is yeah. this a thin time? So, so tell us, this species moment, this moment, tell us a bit more about what you mean by that. And, 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 and is it, is, does, it, does it bear the label of, or, uh, under, or weigh in as, as a sort of thin, thin time in that sense, that it might open yeah. to us um, more greater understanding or humanness, or, or is it a time of crisis or, yeah. What I, is, I think what it's is? all of that at the same time. It's right, the thin time and thin places is where the veil between the temporal and the eternal wears thin, is porous. And, you know, to be, to be clear, uh, a Kairos moment or a thin time, um, often, and this is a very strange thing about our species, often comes with loss, crisis, uh, the rupture of everything mm -hmm. that's come before, and that's not comfortable for us ever. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that is, I think that is a description of now because of the magnitude of, of what we have been, what we are being asked and called to see, the generational transformation that I think we're being called to step up to, uh, uh, you know, I can, and, and that's ecologically, it's racially, socially, we have to, I just keep saying these days, we have a world to remake. I think before the pandemic, we were already, we were already living with this reality that the, the forms and structures and a lot of the understandings that came out of the 20th century mm. weren't working for us. Mm. They don't work. Our technological revolution has made them kind of nonsensical, but they also don't work in human terms. Um, I, I, I would say this is true for the United States. I, I think it's true. I think it's true for the UK as well. Mm. You know, how politics works, how healthcare works you know, the law, education, we, we, we were already understanding that we had to kind of reinvent these things, the, the basic forms and structures, religion, also the forms of religion, mm. will make sense, even if the essence does. Yes. And I think all of that has been brought to this catharsis. Mm. Uh, and also, you know, the racial reckoning, which I think uh, many of us, and I when I use us in that sense, I, you know, I, in my white body, um, thought was much farther along than in fact it was. Yeah. Right. And had let ourselves believe that. Yeah. And, and is part of the problem, you say that it's not working 
very well for some people, for a very few people who have been very successful at gathering a particular sort of wealth to themselves. Um, and you, you know, you and I are in the top 1% wealthy in the world, there's no doubt about it. We are not in the 0.0001% um, of, of billionaires. Um, I mean, and, and what something that worries me is the, the extraordinary growth of material inequality. And yeah. I wonder how worried you are about that. Is that an epiphenomenon? Is that a sign of the problem or not a problem or part of the problem? I, it's emblematic of the problem. Mm. I, I also think you and I, and I also think enough of us, many of us across the spectrum, all the ways we divide ourselves up, don't actually want the comfort of our lives to come at the expense of, mm. of safety and mm. security and, um, so, so what then needs to change? I, I was fascinated by what you write about change. And, and presciently, I mean, On Being is not this year's, On uh, Being Wise, rather, is not this year's book. You wrote it three, four years ago now, I think. Or is it? Yeah, like I said all these things about, it, about all the change ahead. And somebody said to me a couple of years ago, even for the pandemic, what was is it, what was wrong in 2016? <laughs> yeah, no, but it, well, I could tell you a couple of things, but but <laughs> that particular year, I might come on to that. But 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 actually, it seems as if you could have written it this year, and I well, I could ask you whether you write anything different. But but I, I was struck by one thing you said, well, by two things you said about change, uh, and and I wonder if you that that might um, help frame this question about change to you. You say there is more change possible in our lifetimes than we can foresee. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something you learned from the Berlin Wall is, experience. Yeah. But, and it seems to come across with a sort of grounded optimism, mm -hmm. but of also a frisson of, of fear as well, because my goodness, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. And something else you say, so we clearly need what you call seismic shifts. Things have got to change. Mm -hmm. And you say you talk about the cracks and spaces in the world, and you talk about the way that change emerges from these sort of unseen or almost unseen. You have to get up really close to see. I don't. That's what you mean by cracks. Yeah. So, so what do you mean? What are the cracks? What are the cracks that you begin to see in this unstable edifice of the world, from which that optimism? that you've also learned in spite of everything mm -hmm. uh perceives that the radical seismic shifts of good might 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 emerge so i think a, a fascination of mine has been uh for a long time how social change actually happens mm -hmm. how it actually happens which is not necessarily the way we tell the stories um, and I would say one of the realities of this last year is we started to kind of question that, right? That it's shaken up our, our, our total confidence that the way something came down is the whole story. And, you know, I'm very influenced by, um, by a, a, a man named John Paul Lederach who is in the Mennonite tradition uh, and one of the world's great, great there's this giant towering figure in conflict resolution and peace building and social mm -hmm. transformation. Mm -hmm. When that happens, he actually was very involved in Northern Ireland for decades. Oh, right? oh. And in um, he's been involved in Colombia these last years with that, that fragile peace that has been built out of incredible violence for decades. And John Paul says, and this, this really uh, is a good, is a good image for what I've learned. Well, first of all, you know, we use, we throw around this language of social change and meeting change. Well, change can be good, better, and different, right? I mean, we've got a lot of change right now. <laughs> and so I, I started really speaking about what, what, what brings about social transformation. And, and I'm talking about generative transformation. And I understand that's also a big, vague term, but I think what it, for me, what it denotes is what, what it builds up and is creative rather than destructive and, and, and works towards human purpose 
towards human dignity and human wholeness. I, I think, um, you know, words we've used, things we're working with now, and we tend to use the language of, you know, diversity or pluralism or inclusiveness. These are necessary steps, but they're not destinations. They are baby mm -hmm. steps on the way to mm -hmm. becoming whole human beings, living in whole societies with whole institutions. So I think that's the transformation. I think that's the only transformation. You know, the thing about this century and this species moment is that um, Europeans know better than Americans that, you know, the world of a hundred years ago, I mean, that, that we, don't, we don't actually have a lot on the tumult of the early 20th century. Like we really don't, have have greater crises than 2014 or uh, yeah than than 1914, 1914 or, or, or 1940 right yeah. um, but our crises are existential they can spell the end mm -hmm. of life as we've known it mm -hmm. and the possibility of creating something better out of mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I I think we have unless we live into unless we become more fluent in the depths of our humanity, right. the fullness yeah. of our humanity, um, unless we, I think um, this enduring ancient question of what it means to be human, for us, uh, this kindred question of who we will be to each other, these things have become inextricable. Right. And I, 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 it's, mm -hmm. a, yeah, it's a simplistic way to say it, but I think, whether we live into that question of who we will be to each other, whether we honor it uh, and restructure around it, is the, going to be the difference between whether we flourish or whether we merely survive yeah. or don't survive. Or maybe even not even not or even survive. Yeah. And so these are deeply relational issues. Um, they're about our relationship with each other and with those who we call the other and those who we other. Mm -hmm. um, and also I think that seems to be bound up in a clear way that's never been as clear before as our relationship with the material world, with the natural world in which we find ourselves. We made, we made of the natural world an other in modernity. Yes. Yes. And you know, I love, there's a wonderful, I mean, there's a, wonderful old 8th century, eighth to ninth century saint in the north of England who's sometimes known as the Venerable Bede. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, Bede and he's better known in Durham because his bones are, are there in the lovely uh, lovely Norman Galilee Chapel. Um, the reason I, I, I love Bede, he's known for um, writing the first post-Roman English history book, the Ecclesiastical History of the English-Speaking Peoples, but few people know that his most commonly copied hot seller was not the history it was his science book he wrote he wrote a de rerum natura he wrote on on natural on the nature of things which far out copied his history for for five or six centuries and he wrote about the um he, wrote, he did as a compendium. He started with the sky and stars and the atmosphere and how and, and how seawater stays salty while he invented the hydrological cycle, actually. He's, he's brilliant mind, as well as being a deeply contemplative person. But in the preface, as Faith Wallace, who uh, uh, wrote, edited and, and translated this book for, in English for the first time in 2010, would you believe, um, pointed out that he, he, he's, he said as a deeply Christian contemplative in, in around 800. Um, uh, that that um, to before then, sorry, century before then, um, that uh, that we we study nature and the physical properties of nature as as a vocation and a task from God in order that we might fear less, we might be less that we know and understand nature more, so that we would be less fearful. And of course, that immediately introduces this relationship. And, and it, it's made me think about the relationship, the commonality between our relationship with, with nature and, and people that when relationships go wrong, uh, you know, when marriages break down or, or, or people uh, are, are othered, it's that it starts off because there's no knowledge or understanding. So the first thing you need to do to mend a broken relationship that, that starts with ignorance and then leads to fear, and then finally you get to harm, is you correct the knowledge so you know about each other, then the fear can go and be replaced by wisdom, and then harm can be replaced by flourishing. And I was talking myself through this and realized that is precisely 
how our relationship with nature has gone. And it's only in this century we've really understood that the harm in the broken relationship with nature, we always know we could get flooded out and be struck by lightning, and, but we've never realized we could hurt nature fatally. Yeah. And now we do. So I wonder if, it, does that make sense to- It does, well, I also think one of the remarkable things about being alive now is, is also the vocabulary we have that science is also developing for the interrelationship, as you say, that we, we could have known it. You know, honestly, I was reading something, there was that wonderful book, The Invention of Nature by, Alex, uh, by um, Andrea Wolf. Uh, Andrea Wolf, Andrea Wolf. About uh, uh, Alexander von Humboldt. And, you yeah. know, there's a passage in there where she talks about how Humboldt so long ago saw the, that the, the, what the effects of gas and steam would be, right? So, I mean, we could have seen it. Um, but even that the language of ecosystem Mm. It's 100 years old, and it takes 100 years for something yeah. like that to sink in. Yeah. And now that now we're documenting that, and it's so it's so beautiful to see. It's so thrilling, and it's also terrifying and tragic that it comes so late, where we're on the cusp of mm. understanding that, as you say, understanding our destructive powers. Yes, and Humboldt saw human literally saw um, uh, topsoil. Being being had been taken away by by deforest, human deforestation uh, back in the uh, late 18th century. I, it's, he saw it coming. He really did. But since you mentioned Andrea Wolf, let me ask you. I have to ask you for advice. Then this is a bit I was going to ask you. I need to ask your advice, Krista, about this science thing, because I was actually very fortunately. I don't know if you know the rules. Andrea won Wolf won the Royal Society Book Prize. I think it was 2018 was it, for that lovely book on, uh, well, uh, on, on yeah. Humboldt. And it's you know it's a fun event. I happen to be to be there and and uh, there's a four short list of the candidates and they read a 10 minute bit from their book and then there's music and champagne and Brian Cox who's very famous here um, yeah. uh, opens the envelope and, and it's just like the Oscars and hoorays. And anyway I, I, I bumped into Andrea with a glass afterwards and I, I said to her um, uh, yeah, I didn't want to ask her this question. I said, well, who are you looking forward to telling about this Royal Society Prize? And, and she said, well, I'm looking forward to telling my, my, my German uh, chemistry teacher who's still alive and long retired when I was a girl. And I said, well, that's nice. And she said, no, it's not nice at all. Because she was the woman who told me that I was stupid, would never understand science and should do cooking and gardening like a good little girl. And um, and, and, and she, she goes, goes to wave the Royal Society, you know, prior. of course she gets the science. But then she said this lovely thing. She said, you know, science is like a palace, a gorgeous palace with many doors. But she said at school, we only show children one door and yeah. said, we can't all go through that door. We know the door we mean. I found another door through writing biography of Humboldt. Mm -hmm. And so this week, Christus, um, uh, uh, matter of fact, um, it's a good week for you to be visiting us because the Royal Society and been involved in this has launched a project. You can check out the website called Reimagining Science, yeah. where we, we'd like to find a way in which people can engage in science more like they will in music or painting or art or theatre or cooking and feel confident and human about it, just like so doors into science so in all that with all the people you meet and all the wisdom you glean what advice would you give to scientists who long to take science out of that shiny little box of expert and clipboards and white coats and to open those other doors or hack through the brambles so that we can share science as a common good and a contemplative act how could we do that well, you probably could answer that question better than I could, but, but I'll, you know, I mean, just, I think that book, The Invention of Nature, uh, you know, it, and it's not just that book, but I think it's an especially good introduction to the concept of natural philosophy and that world before the world we all inherited where, where we imagine contrary to the history of science and the history of Western religion, that the two things are in a great battle. Mm. Um, they were always in conversation until a couple hundred years ago, which is just, you know, less than a blink of the cosmic eye. Um, and I, you know, it's been 
I feel like, again, having doing the work I do across this young century, it's been interesting to watch kind of coming into the 21st century where, where that battle was brewing, but it's never been global. It's never even, it's never been all religion and it's never been all scientists. Um, going through the new atheist period, which, mm. which you know, had science had some very uh, scientists with um, a big public presence as, as some of the the voices, and it that made a lot of um, that landed with a lot of and got a lot of attention and created a lot of energy around it. But what I've seen follow that more quietly is that it's not, you know it's not that science and religion speak the same language or ask the, the same questions. And that's part of the reason setting it up as a battle is problematic, because if you're not asking the same questions, you're not actually coming up with answers that you can pit against each other and, 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 and retain the integrity of the disciplines. But um, what I feel that I'm seeing, kind of coming back to what I said a minute ago about science and religion being on this territory of what it means to be human and how we must um, approach that with greater sophistication and urgency now, I see science and religion in a new kind of conversation, a new kind of companionship, not necessarily agreeing on things. It's too, that's too simplistic, but together illuminating um, how we must live, right? What, and, and you know, the language of ecosystem, um, or the microbiome. <laughs> yeah. Um, these are not, all yeah. ways into relationship, interconnection, community, mm -hmm. um, belonging. Yeah. You know, I've, there's, there's a lot of pra empirical evidence that what you say is right at the moment. You know, and I'm involved in a project between York and Durham uh, universities on, on, on getting churches fired to get their minds around science and particularly Christian leaders. So we, we do a crazy thing. We get we get bishops and, and ordinary, um, seminary leaders and, and so into labs talking with young scientists and typically um, or, or and senior scientists too, whether it's earth science, neurology, all sorts of things. Um, it's also funded by uh, this, the uh, Templeton uh, uh, has been for a few, few years, really, in, a really interesting project. And the most interesting empirical discovery is that although these church pastor people have typically been humanities trained, and in our country particularly, that means they, they stopped doing science when they're about 10 years old and it's their weak suit. And, and, and the scientists are not typically confessional or believing, but they'll, or, but they'll be the sort that is open to think that, well, I, actually, it would be a good thing if the church understood science better. But within 10 minutes, every time, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, what's that? No, tell me, can I see the other microscope again? What, can, this, or playing with the robots or, or whatever it is, or asking about black holes. There is a natural affinity to scientific wisdom Wisdom, of course, the wisdom is embedded in philosophy, in the, in the, in the word. Yes, but of the, course, I love you using that word. I mean, we're, we're comrades in that. Well, that's right. I, I say I'm so grateful to my University of York. I'm just saying this for, for, for allowing, for calling my job title natural philosophy again for the first time in it's 200 years. How, how lucky am I? Um, but I wonder if you could say something about... Um, about the sort of social healing. In fact, we've got some people asking about that. And I think this is a good context to say more about what you mean by it. And of course, it's not just um, the sort of new sort of atheist, very hardened atheist and the very extreme believer. It's it's yeah. political right and left. It's global north and south. It's gendered. Yeah. It's all sorts of other. And yeah. you say that your your the key to this has been, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but seeing the good in the other. So not, in other words, it's not the goal to agree. It, it, it's yeah. the good to live along, but to see as much good as one can in the other. And you tell a lovely story of a very sort of, you know, Republican American right wing church who learned about the environment biblically mm -hmm. from those who differed from them and learned to respect that. And 
I don't know if you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm Michael, Michael, um, Michael Golker the other day who, who, who runs a project called the Colossians Forum that sounds as if oh, they- Oh, my colleague, uh, Lucas Johnson works with them as well. Okay, there we are. They do with them in our, in our social healing work, yes. Right, and that's, that's social healing. So here's the question to, to group this one. Between the, the type of atheists who think that ev all, everything we've been talking about is nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. Apart from the other side, and, and, and the type of you know, believer for whom that new atheism, how do those people, how do those people learn to see the good in each other and what each other is saying? Well, so, you know, one thing I want to say is, um, one of the fascinating things about this show, about my, my, my program, my podcast, is from the very beginning, there were, there were many people who said, I'm agnostic or I'm atheist, but I like this show because, because I want to be part of the, of the conversations about moral imagination, which often um, happen in the context under the rubric of religion. And mm -hmm there is such a deep moral dimension to so many of the civilizational and cultural um, challenges before us. And I don't think that um, only religious people want to be involved morally. I mean, I know that's not true. So I guess one of the things I've been committed to um, is, is not, I think the framing, right? The, I, 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 I I want, I, I think creating spaces where people can show up as human beings who yes, have certain identities and yes, have convictions hmm. uh, and important, meaningful disagreements. That's the thing, you know, we don't, the things that divide us now are, are meaningful and, uh, and, and it won't be transformative for, you know, for us to get together and kind of put our differences to one side and enjoy each other and then go away. The differences are meaningful, but I think to me the, but what divide, okay, so I think here's my, my kind of simple definition of the, of the goal of, a, of the spaces we can create, the new kinds of, um, of, of, of seeing each other, uh, the new discussions is, is can, we, um, can we create spaces, conversations, experiences where, where what divides us doesn't have to define what can become possible between us. And where we don't allow a lack of common ground, which frankly is in short supply, mm -hmm. um, especially around certain issues, certain questions. We can't allow, we can't make common life um, dependent on common ground or, or being on the same page. We have to, we are sharing life, right? That's again, where this language of ecosystem, where we, how, what we are understanding about how the natural world functions and when there is flourishing mm. is that um, there is interdependence. And so to let that be the reality, I also think we could spend much more time gathering, articulating around the questions we're holding. Mm -hmm. And even those of us, um, oh, are, okay. Are, yeah, I, my screen, sorry, my screen, it looks like you disappeared. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm still here. I'm still okay. here. It's all I still. I don't know what happened. That's all right. Zoom. Um, can, can I, let, let me, don't worry, let me, not, let me just nod you because in fact, it, along with what you were just saying, so someone who's with us has asked, has asked on, um, a relevant question to your current flow, which is about our perception of relationship and 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 and, and healing, brokenness, and common ground around um, the different parts of the world. And they're asking, um, is the perception our relationship towards nature, and therefore, I suppose, the stock of treasures that we might be able to draw on to mend it, different in other parts of the of the world? I thought it was an interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. You mean the the approaches, the ways yeah, of approaches to nature. Yeah, we, yes, yes. So no, I'm no. very sweeping statements, I think, especially about how um, Western industrial economies. <laughs> um, it's not but funny, but it wasn't the criticism. Uh, I think it was asking about other traditions. Yes, yes. That's the thing. 
I think so much of what we're learning scientifically and what we see about how we can survive and heal our societies moving forward leads us back to intelligence that we have possessed that is in um, often in indigenous cultures, in traditional cultures, um, mm. that is wrapped inside religious, religious teachings. And uh, there's this interesting consonance of, of things we've known and things we've known in our bodies. And then what we're learning intellectually and in our fields of discovery. Mm. Mm. I, I, I know that you, um, you talk about your, your, your choice to study theology yeah. And I'm fascinated by that because that's come up come up quite a few times and you 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 write about uh, you write very movingly about your experience at, at, at Yale, particularly with Ellen Davis, who I think yeah. influenced you a very great, great deal. But I wondered if if um, now talking more about theology now than, than, than about faith or religious belief and, you know, to the secular world, what would you say that in this species moment? the study discipline the understanding of theology can bring oh right so again i don't i really don't divide the world up in that way in terms of secular and religious i i they're all interactive and i think some of the people i know who are secular are 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 are, are so deeply ethical and principled that's and true. Have I... moral imagination and and that's an, you know and 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 some people who are who are um, officially religious are very secular in many yeah, ways no, in terms of the ways so but you know so to me um but if you ask the question of, I mean, i've thought about this a lot the question of theology in this species moment i feel that some of the some of, a lot of the vocabulary ways of thinking and ways of analyzing of theology feel more resonant to me for the whole of culture than they have at any time in my lifetime. Uh, we, don't, we don't have big enough words in our secular vocabulary mm -hmm. to talk about redemption and repentance, mm -hmm. atonement, repair. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even the language of mindfulness, which, which comes from, mm -hmm. from the tradition of Buddhism, um, uh, you know, forgiveness and reconciliation lamentation well i have felt in this last year we yeah. it's so clear again in western societies certainly i just speak for the united states we don't know how to grieve and how to go through the process that is in the traditions of honoring grief and mourning mm. and also working with that which is the move to lamentation which is that you take that in and you honor it and you also are able to integrate it into your sense of self and see a future but it's not about denying it it's not about dismissing it and i think we are going to be living for years in this culture with the ripple effects of our failure to grieve the losses um yeah this, that, the, that the pandemic has brought Upon us. Is 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 lamentation in that sense something you think we can or should learn to do individually, or or actually something more corporate? Corporate. I think, yeah, you know, I had in the middle of the pandemic, I had a, a call with a bunch of rabbis um, in the That's Midwestern it. United States, <laughs> and they were talking to me about well, they were asking the question, which I actually think all of us should be asking, like, what can what can our offering be? to the whole, to the society. And they were telling me that in the tradition, in the, in the historical tradition, um, rituals of lamentation were not just internal for the community. They were rituals of lamentation that were offered up communally. And I just, that stayed with me as what, I said, do that, right? We, I, I think across all of yeah. our identities, secular or religious, um, we would have we would welcome communal rituals of lamentation and we simply don't have that in secular society but we need it there's we a reason need. these things arose mm -hmm. I, I it's interesting you mention that because we at our little church around the parish just around the corner um 
we have over lockdown discovered the prayer form called lamentation yeah. um, or rediscover i mean rediscovered it and, and kicking us well why didn't why haven't we been doing this this yeah. for years um to the extent that in a little prayer room um it's an on online thing actually you know that there's things to be thankful for and there's a whole little board uh, which is now headed lamentation and um of course we they discovered all this rich biblical material there and it's it's resonating with people so resonant and i wonder how we make it a gift a servant sort of gift because it's it's as if people want to get this out of them as you say it's mm -hmm. not about it's not about dissolving your own pot of misery it's not about saying that all these terrible things are really good and it's it'll be good I mean, in the it's end. all happening for a purpose for right a, yeah that. it's not yeah. that absolutely yeah. never that yeah. that's not authentic yeah. but it's authentically something you you said it just now you pass through it mm -hmm. and there is something the other side and you that, let it touch you right yeah. we we spend so much energy in terror that is understandable and reasonable in its way but not wanting this to touch us but in fact if we don't let it touch us we can't go on living we don't um we don't get to be whole on the other side no no i, I wondered um i think you know some of the types i've talked to have known for many years is, is a man called tim Bradford, who um, was co science correspondent for the guardian uh, mm -hmm. for many years you you could talk with you could he'd do a lovely um on being actually um thinking of, of tim uh he's a new zealand with his grandchildren now i think or L london but uh, anyway he found the events of 2016 i mean the, he's you know been a newspaper correspondent for years it, it, it center left in the in the, the guardian he's an immensely compassionate man who 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 also by the way wrote a uh, wrote a master's thesis on the book of job so um <laughs> there but, you go. one of the great lamentations yeah. so you can see why, why i loved him um yeah. but he found those events so deeply disturbing he he wrote a book now his lamentation took him this is circling us back to science again he wrote a book called the consolation of physics so in the manner of boethius his consolation of philosophy all those centuries ago and on death row in 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 that prison in in rome i think it was and and in, um and he he starts off by contemplating on the Voyager probes. He wanted in his mind to go the furthest he could <laughs> from the world that human humans have affected. So he, he writes the first chapter on, on Voyager. And I'm just wondering whether, whether that contemplation is a way of mm. lamenting mm. or whether it's just escapism. I don't think lamentation is just escapism, but no i don't think it is i think it's letting the grief into our bodies um, yes. and also as you say i think we have to let it into our communal right identity and experience it's health right it's it's right. a strange thing again about us but it's a way of being uh -huh. but maybe what you need to do you lamentation is maybe it's giving grief a journey yeah maybe that's what tim was doing it's a way of traveling with grief Yes, so that it just, I, I just gets like a jelly around. Wonderfully said. Tom, I want to ask you before we finish, I'm curious as a scientist, um, how this language of the species moment strikes you. Oh. And if there's something that, oh. is there a dimension to that? Um, um, for I've, you, I've, I've your question. But that, um, well, I'm saying, I'm, yes, I th the answer is yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because we, there are many places in which it does um there are deep questions coming out of of physics of of our quantum mechanics of matter and uh well you know and statistical mechanics too there are there's a place where it's uh, we don't, there are three eyes with which physics looks on the world there's the quantum not two there's the quantum mechanical for things small and there's the the, the 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 general relativity the einstein and everything and and, and the the universe at all and there's this the third cousin that's so often forgotten but that's the one einstein said he would go to the state for and that's thermodynamics he said he, einstein which you began with you know he said he wouldn't he, you know he, he pushed relativity he, he wouldn't go to the state for that but he would for thermodynamics and we always forget this and there's a place in the universe where these three come and, and intersect and, and those are black holes 
Um, and we just saw one, right, thanks to the Black Hole Project last year. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I think there are, there, we're on the threshold of knowing that we are part of the universe we're studying. I think all this is telling us that the early modern random assumption that we could be detached objects from the subject rather than immersed subjects was wrong mm -hmm. and that we need to rediscover science as you know, the words I would use it for it, a God-given and vocational but there is a secular anthropological ways of saying the same thing yeah. as a tool or a way in which we can befriend and become explicitly immersed in a philosophical in a in a wise way mm -hmm. in the universe that we're, we're in it, 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 I think that's how I'd begin to answer this question and it seems to be saying very similar things to um to yours does that make it does you know my kind of shorthand definition of of spiritual life as it as it interests me is is that it is about befriending reality yes and that is the reality inside us which we are learning about together with science um and the reality of of the natural world and and part of all as we've been discussing part of that frontier is comprehending mm -hmm. which i actually think we've also known in our bodies but not had words and ideas for how yeah, inextricable right. all of these things yes. are. and 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 this is where poetry comes in and we've got a couple of well maybe one minute but i'm <laughs> poetry chris i want to ask you about this because it seems that when when I bring science and theology together, I, we have to talk about poetry. And also, when we had a little session on Monday, by the way, we, we brought science and poetry together, and people were talking about theology, just popped out, and then the two were able to join. And I wonder if you could just finish by saying something about the poetic. And I know that's deeply well, meaningful for you and how well, that might help us. Yeah, poetry is a form of language that all of our traditions have always employed, have understood. Is, it has to be part of the uh, 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 you know, of the of the of of the spectrum of language with which we point at ultimate things. But the other thing about poetry, or uh, that we point at the truth of reality, um, truth is bigger than facts. Part of the reason we're we're so paralyzed right now is we've we've acted like truth can be contained in mere fact. Facts are important, but they're not sufficient. And poetry, I think does that with language. I think one of the reasons poetry is rising up now is because it gives us a way out of this. Um, it, 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 it defies our poetry. Somebody, a poet said to me once, uh, poetry is language against which we have no defenses. And that's very refreshing right now. Poetry just uh, puts words that get at undergirding truths um, out in the room. And so there's something about the nature of poetry that we are called to simply stand before it. And anything that does that for us right now, uh, across all of our differences and divisions, is such a gift. Well, it's been such a gift talking with you, Krista. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, for uh, those who pose questions, I'm sorry we haven't got through all of them. I've tried to weave as many in uh, as, as I could. We could clearly go on for a very long time, uh, but I think we will. Um, all these conversations are lifelong conversations. Uh, for anyone listening, either live or on repeat in the months that follow, um, uh, all the matters of this conversation and many others are all on Krista's On Being website. There are hundreds, yes, I think, of podcasts. Yes, and Tom, I have to say, we're just about to launch something called the Wisdom App in July. Oh, my word. Yes, <laughs> you heard it first here. <laughs> and I'm very excited about it. And there's also our Poetry Unbound podcast. So all of those, look for those. Well, look for those. Look, look, look for those, everyone. And as Thank I said- Thank you for this... having me. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're infinitely grateful, Krista. Please come back to the York Festival of Ideas. Can you, be, as, as, as your wisdom on being uh, uh, grows and hopefully the species moment will turn out through lamentation as we pass through the other side to come out to um, a sort of pasture of, of greater understanding, as, as you said. So please, everyone, look out for it on the Watch Your Life. Um, you will find, if you wish to order any of Krista's books from your local friendly Fox Lane books, um, that's Kirsty, not Krista. Kirsty runs Fox Lane Books. Please uh, uh, order from her, and um, uh, th uh, you, they'll. Um, uh, you can learn more about this topic fr from there. Um, there are a few um, 
uh, events still to come this weekend is the last weekend of the York Festival of Ideas. Um, uh, please let us know uh, your ideas about them, um, tweet about them, hashtag York Ideas, uh, and uh, look out and register for the rest of the, um, uh, the events. But finally, uh, 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 thanking everyone who's here tonight, who's watching, uh, watching live, those lovely questions, but particularly um, uh, thank you to uh, our, our, my guests, our guests at York Festival Ideas, Chris, Krista Tippett. Bless you, Krista, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. And good night now, everyone.